I just felt that what would ever be the point of being rescued? She doesn't do anything to anyone, and there's no reason that you should have her. Please let her go. Please. The Smart family had this beautiful, picture-perfect life until June 2002, when everything turned into a nightmare. I, I couldn't stop thinking about Lois, Elizabeth, and the family, and where I was, and what was happening. Yeah, I felt like my life was coming apart at the seams. They could have never imagined that something so twisted and awful could happen to them, especially in a place they called home. This is the most twisted child abduction case by a rapist. At 14 years old, Elizabeth Smart had everything that anyone would ask for, a nice home and a family that loved her. She was the second of six children of Edward and Lois Smart and lived in an upscale neighborhood in Salt Lake City. She was happy and content with her life and was described as respectful, well-behaved, and completely religious. She loved playing the harp and was really good at it. She just really was kind of the pride and joy, I think, of Edward and Lois. She was so, so perfect. At, at 14 years old, she wasn't interested in boys. She was interested in the harp and horses. Then on June 5th, 2002, days before Elizabeth was set to graduate from middle school, the, the most, most unimaginable, unimaginable thing, thing happened. As she was sleeping in her room, which she shared with her little sister, she was jolted awake in the middle of the night by a man pressing a knife to her throat and ordering her to get out of bed. The stranger threatened to kill her and her entire family if she didn't cooperate. Fearing that the person would carry out his threat, Elizabeth went with him and disappeared into the night where her nightmare, her nightmare was, was just, just beginning. beginning. Elizabeth's nine-year-old sister, Mary Catherine, pretended to be asleep until she was sure that the monster that had taken her sister was gone. Then she rushed to her parents' bedroom and gave them the devastating news. At first, her parents didn't believe her and thought that she just had a nightmare. But when they found one of the window screens had been cut out with a knife, they knew that their nine-year-old was telling the truth. Someone had taken their teenage daughter, but who could do such a horrifying thing? Despite her young age, Mary Catherine turned out to be a pretty good witness, giving the police a detailed description of the guy that took her sister. She described the person as a white man with dark hair, about the height of her brother Charles, who was 5'8", and about 30 or 40 years old. She said that the man threatened Elizabeth with what she thought was a gun and told her to be quiet and he wouldn't hurt her. She also said that the man's voice sounded familiar, but she couldn't remember where she had heard it. Okay, be quiet. If you scream, I'll shoot you, but if you don't, I'm gonna Did his voice sound familiar to you? Yeah. Can you tell me where you heard that before? Mary Catherine said that she heard Elizabeth asking the guy why he was doing this, and the man answered something like, for ransom. The news of Elizabeth's kidnapping shocked the entire community, with thousands of people coming in to help search for her. They spent the day scouring the area using helicopters, dogs, and every available resource. Flyers with her smiling face were posted everywhere in the area, with local media stations picking up the story. We begin today with the statewide alert for the missing girl and the man who took her. Now, the kidnapping happened around 2 o'clock this morning, again, as we said, in the Salt Lake Federal Heights area, abducted from her bedroom at gunpoint. Elizabeth's devastated parents, Ed and Lois, were at the forefront of the search, and they appeared on TV multiple times, begging the kidnapper to return their daughter. She doesn't do anything to anyone, and there's no reason that you should have her. Please let her go. Please. 
At some point, Ed was so overwhelmed with the anguish that he even collapsed and he had to be taken to the hospital. He would later say that it was his faith and the support from the community that helped him push on. A week into the search, investigators started looking into several potential suspects, including some of Elizabeth's family members who were questioned and forced to take a lie detector test. Questions like, did you kill Elizabeth? Did you take Elizabeth? Did you have anything to do with her abduction? My polygraph was between seven and eight hours but you know in that included a two-hour stare down with the guy when I said you know I can't do anything else I can't I mean I'm inconclusive fine it's in your court one suspect in particular really stood out to the investigators a guy named Richard Ritchie he was a career criminal on parole with a history of substance abuse, and he had worked for the Smart family for a while. When the police searched his trailer, they found several pieces of jewelry that he had reportedly stolen from Elizabeth's mother, Lois, and some neighbors. Investigators believed that Richard could have probably killed Elizabeth when she caught him stealing, but Richard completely denied having anything to do with the teen's disappearance. Before investigators could get anything out of him, Richard died of a brain hemorrhage in August 2002, bringing this lead to a dead end. Despite police being convinced that Richard was behind Elizabeth's kidnapping, Mary Catherine, the only witness in the case, strongly disagreed. She maintained that she knew the person behind the voice that she heard that night, and it was not Richard. The police, however, dismissed her, thinking she was confused and did not know what she was saying. But as it turned out, she did. She did. In October 2002, almost six months after her sister's kidnapping, Mary Catherine was looking through the Guinness Book of Record when it suddenly came to her who had, who had taken, taken her sister. sister. Apparently, in the fall of 2001, she, her mom, and Elizabeth met a homeless street preacher calling himself Emmanuel in town. Lois gave him $5 and offered him a job to work on the roof of their house and rake leaves. Okay, look at our house. Mary Catherine told investigators that she believed that Emmanuel was the person who had taken her sister, but again the police were skeptical. They thought that it was impossible for a nine-year-old to connect a voice that she had only heard once to someone that had only worked for the family for a short while. Luckily, her family did believe her, and despite police telling them not to do anything about it, they went ahead and made a sketch of Emmanuel and released it to the media. The image was featured on Larry King Live and America's Most Wanted, and within a short while, a woman came forward and identified the sketch as that of her brother, Brian David Mitchell. She provided the police with pictures of Brian, which were then published all over the news. Born on October 18th, 1953, Brian had quite a troubled history. When he was 16, he got time in juvie after he reportedly exposed himself to an eight-year-old girl. Over the years, Brian had been married three times and had four children with his first two wives. After divorcing his second wife, Brian married Wanda Barzi, a then 40-year-old divorcee who already had six children. Both Wanda and Brian were active members of their church, and Brian had even started going by the name of Emmanuel, claiming to be a prophet of God who experienced prophetic visions. This did not sit well with the other church members, and the two were soon kicked out of the church. They then started preaching and begging in the streets, with Brian wearing white robes and tunics and growing a beard, trying to make himself look like the image of Jesus. When Elizabeth was kidnapped, she soon recognized her abductor as the soft-spoken beggar preacher that her mom had helped in the streets. He took her deep into the woods to a campsite in the mountain behind her home, where Wanda was waiting for them. Wanda reportedly made Elizabeth change out of her pajamas into a robe, and then Brian performed a ceremony that was supposed to marry her to him. Then he proceeded to violate her, and that was just the beginning. For the next weeks that followed, Elizabeth was kept tied to a tree with metal cables where Brian constantly violated her and threatened to kill her if she didn't cooperate. She would go without food for days, and when she did eat, it was often garbage. Brian would also force her to drink alcohol and use narcotics to lower her resistance and sometimes make her look at explicit magazines. I felt so 
filthy and so broken and so completely shattered. I just felt that what would ever be the point of being rescue. Brian told her that he was some sort of messiah who would emerge in seven years, be stoned by a mob, lie in the street for days, and then rise up and kill the Antichrist. He told her that she was the first of the many young girls that he planned to kidnap and who would accompany him as he battled the Antichrist. He would later try to kidnap two more girls, including Elizabeth's 15-year-old cousin, to make them his brides, but luckily did not succeed. After two months in the camp, Brian had managed to accomplish what he wanted, break Elizabeth's spirit. She was no longer thinking about escaping and had resigned herself to her fate, believing that there, that there was, was no, no way, way out. out. That's even when she appeared in public with her captors, wearing a headscarf and a veil. She never tried to escape or do anything to show that she needed help. One time, someone had even called the police when Elizabeth, Brian, and Wanda were at a public library. The person noticed their weird clothes and recognized Elizabeth's eyes. But when the police arrived and confronted them, Brian claimed that the teen was his daughter and that it was against their religion to remove the veil. The detective tried to question Elizabeth, but she didn't say anything. Brian told the detective that it was against their religion for women to speak in public. Elizabeth would later say that Wanda signaled her not to move and grabbed her leg under the table. As the policeman left, she would later say that she felt like Hope was walking out the door and she was mad at herself for not saying anything. The three would go on to visit grocery stores and a restaurant without getting noticed and would even attend a party where this picture was taken and you can see Elizabeth wearing a veil and Brian is the one with the turban and the beard. Afterward, the trio moved to San Diego where they spent several months going from campsite to campsite and eating at homeless shelters. At one point in February 2003, Brian was even arrested after breaking into a church, but he somehow managed to weasel himself out of jail after only a few days. I had, I had for the first time in 22 years, I got drunk that night, and uh, and the whole night was just a nightmare, and and it was and it, and, and I it, this week in jail has uh, been like. Uh, Jonah getting swallowed by the whale. After getting released from jail, Brian decided that it was time to move again. But this time, he wanted them to go as far away as possible. And that's when Elizabeth came up with a plan. She knew that the chances of her family ever finding her would be higher if they moved back to Utah. So she told Brian that God had spoken to her and wanted them to go back to Utah. Incredibly, Brian agreed and they started hitchhiking back. On March 12, 2003, police stopped three people outside a Walmart in Sandy, Utah, a few miles from Salt Lake City. The trio turned out to be Brian, Wanda, and Elizabeth. Elizabeth was wearing a gray wig, sunglasses, and a veil for disguise. At first, Elizabeth, who was obviously still under Brian's control, refused to identify herself to the police, saying that she was someone else. I held up the uh, poster right next to her face and said, Elizabeth, this is you. She says, no, that's not me. The officers could see how terrified she was of Brian. So they pulled her aside and asked her again, you are Elizabeth Smart, right? And when she replied, thou sayest, meaning yes, the teen was then put into handcuffs and taken to a police station where her dad found her. <laughs> the door just flew open and my dad came running into the room. He just looked at me for a second. Then he came over and he picked me up in the biggest hug you can imagine. And he just started crying. And I said, Elizabeth, is it you? She said, yes, Dad. And I, I stood there crying and crying and crying. As Elizabeth was being reunited with her family, Brian and Wanda were then arrested and charged in connection with Elizabeth's kidnapping. Wanda pleaded guilty to the charge and was sentenced to 15 years in prison, while Brian was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. What do you think about this case? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section, and if you liked this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more.